I apologize for talking like Cybershell in my last video. It was a mistake and it won't happen again. I'm working on a video that needs a decent amount of research right now, so I decided to take a week-long break from it to play this many hours of the Fear and Hunger franchise. I have a lot of thoughts about it that I want to put into words. I don't know how original these thoughts are, but I don't think there's that many people out there that share them, so I'll say them here. I just want to isolate the parts that worked for me and didn't work for me in the first game and explain why I think the second game leans more into the latter than the former, making it a less unique experience. Let me start by talking about the reason I love the first game. These are opinions I think most of the player base shares, but I gotta lay the foundation for this masterwork of critique. Uh. The thing I love the most about Fear and Hunger 1 is its complete disregard for audience sensibilities. This goes for both its difficulty and its subject matter. It really goes a long way to instilling the dark, oppressive atmosphere that the fans of this game keep barking about. Like, I obviously don't mind people censoring the game for triggering reasons the same way I don't really care if people make an easy mode mod of the game or not. But here's the thing, to play Fear and Hunger is to be subject to the machinations of a cold and inhospitable world. The god of this world made it thusly for a reason. Your interference with that god's machinations nations kind of diminishes the artistry. I'm not saying it makes it objectively better or worse, I mean if you enjoy it more then what can I tell you right? But not everything has to be such a curated experience for audience comfort. By making the game more palatable, what did you really get out of this? Like what, are you just trying to get to the phenomenal writing? I'm not trying to be a big gamer guy here, I'm not even that much of a gamer man. But my main criticism of Fear and Hunger 1 is actually that it doesn't go far enough. Wherever Fear and Hunger starts to acknowledge audience sensibilities, it starts to fail for me. There shouldn't be a safe spot in this game. This safe safe spot right here invalidates the entire latter half of the game. The oppressive atmosphere is diminished by the sanctuary that I can resort to in time of need. And that's bad, because in Fear and Hunger, the oppressive atmosphere is what the developer should be trying to maximize. That was the main draw. That's the reason we're all here. A safe spot gives you hope. It gives a reprieve. It gives you things that I think this game would be better without. Fear and Hunger is at its best when it's mauling you with a hammer without missing a beat, and the whole latter half of the game is just missed beats for me. On a whole though, everything from the dire sound design to the bleak RPG Maker graphics to the kind of buggy and broken gameplay to the fact that you can get raped by some of the disgusting enemies in this game, it it all combines to make an experience totally unique. No one else is doing it like this. Listen, I love Dark Souls, and I definitely think it's a better designed game than Fear and Hunger, but Fear and Hunger has the vibe that I was hoping for when I first bought Dark Souls. This game really instilled that sense of hopelessness in me. I was afraid around every corner, not just of losing my progress, but of what the fuck these enemies would do to me, which is why I was so disappointed by Fear and Hunger 2. I mean, listen, I like the game. I like it just fine. I played this many hours of it. I'll probably play more. It's a lot bigger. It's a lot more ambitious. You got twice the number of playable characters, you got a gigantic map, you got tons of puzzles, tons of dialogue, tons of lore, it's a very admirable effort. And all of it combines to create a game that feels less like a sequel to Fear and Hunger and more like an installment in Resident Evil or Silent Hill. It fails to scratch the same itch the first game did. Let me start with the first thing, the lack of sexual violence. Listen, I know this is a weird thing to complain about, but it's Fear and Hunger, man. That's one of the things you're supposed to fear. The creator of this world is supposed to have so little regard for your well-being that they can just throw that shit at you without blinking. The sequel has comparatively little of that, and coupled with a lack of claustrophobia, the vast and open map, the brighter color design, it all combined for a more palatable experience. This was a more standard game. The creator had so much regard for audience sensibilities with this one that so many of the unique and cool ideas from the first one kinda got washed away. The only thing that keeps me playing Fear and Hunger 2 is that I just kinda like the characters, but even then, I'm always thinking that they could be utilized better. More on that in a bit. Now this is obviously just personal preference, but I hate puzzle games. They're my least favorite part of any game and to this day I can't understand why so many horror games are full of them. The worst part of the first game was the mannequin puzzle. The worst part of the second game are the 25 million puzzles the developer put in it, all of which are worse than the mannequin puzzle. I feel nothing from this map. Being made to walk back and forth through its corridors makes me want to close the game not out of frustration or hopelessness or insanity, but out of boredom. The backtracking ends up being tedious, especially when you're running to complete a puzzle you already know the answer to and which you've completed several times. I beat this game multiple times by the way if that shows you anything about how how much I still like it. I'm not saying the game shouldn't have any puzzles, but the puzzles that are here just don't add up to a very dark or oppressive atmosphere, which, as I stated earlier, is the thing that I want to maximize with these games. The places I thought were the best were in the rare dimension. That is a place we should have spent more time in. We should rarefy the whole map. The second worst part of Fear and Hunger 1 was, as I said earlier, the safe spot that completely nullified the threat of the latter half of the game. The sequel has not one, but two safe spots. One of them with this soothing jazz song that plays when you're sitting around in it. Why is the dark 
dark and oppressive atmosphere game trying to calm my nerves right now. Listen, when I boot up Fear and Hunger, I want to be suffocating in inescapable torment. That's a good time for me. I'm not saying there isn't the odd fucked up thing that can happen in these safe spots, but honestly, I'm of the opinion that even the coin flip beds in Fear and Hunger 1 were a little too safe. Some people argue that coin flips and RNG add artificial difficulty, whatever that means, and that a good game would allow you to overcome the trial with your own skill. I used to agree with this until very recently when I played Fear and Hunger. I think the RNG hammers home some of the themes of this story that some things are just completely out of your hands. That no matter how skilled you are, if the powers that be will your failure, then it shall be so. If you're playing as a character who is a pawn in a game incomprehensible, the senseless cruelty just feels more right. After all, what blade can cut fate? My personal desire was for the sequel to go harder on the original's ideas, not to back off into safer territory. It feels like this game actually kinda cares about me and my feelings now, and there's enough of those kinds of games already out there. There's also some differences on a narrative level that make the second game fall flat. I'll start by praising the second game for having better dialogue and better written characters, but the problem is with how it's all put into place. In the first game, no matter who you start with, you all have the same goal. Different motivations, but the same goal. Find Lagarde. This singular, unifying purpose gives you, the player, a target. Something to aim for so that you know how hard you fail every time you die. When you become preoccupied with the simple task of just surviving, this is what you have to remind yourself it's all for. What stays in the back of your mind. This is the lightning rod. You're thinking, yeah, I gotta find this guy, but first let me get away from the rape ogre with a two-foot cock that's chasing Oh, I got captured by the bald guy again. And he's cutting off my arms and my legs and my penis. Okay. In the second game, the goal is kind of unclear. Now let me be clear, this is fine in principle. All the characters have different reasons for arriving at the town of Prehevel, and I don't really have a problem with that necessarily. Like, technically this is a battle royale, but most of the characters don't even try to participate in it, and many of the characters fail in the process of not participating in the battle royale. It all lacks focus. The goal for most of them seems to just be survive until we get out of this mess. The key word being until. The three-day time progress mechanic lets us know that there will, in fact, be an end. There was no such mercy in the first game. None of this works for me. None of these characters arrive at the place with enough intent. There's not enough reason for these characters to actually run through this gauntlet of terrors. The only reason that exists is external, within us, the sheer curiosity of the player. Is that inherently bad? Not necessarily. I actually love these characters, all of them. I can't decide on a favorite. Marina is the cutest, Olivia is the most interesting, Karin is literally Marco just like is the me. guy I want to Bro, I really feel well. bad for I'm I to to But no matter how much I like the characters, the lack of a unifying purpose driving them through this world makes it fall flat for me. Actually, let me rephrase that. It doesn't even need to be a unifying purpose, just a strong and clear enough purpose, a reason to get out there. Some characters kinda have this, like Karin, but on a narrative level, most of them don't have enough reason to be going through this. The lack of a need makes this game feel less tense and urgent. A lot of these characters just don't really care. Literally, Marco is just stopping by. Where he really wants to be is Rondon. He has someone waiting for him there. He could have just as easily stopped over in Budapest for all he cared. I guess for most of these characters, the game is more about uncovering a mystery that you never wanted to uncover in the first place. And to an extent, I kind of find that compelling. But once again, it does not maximize that feeling of dark, oppressive atmosphere. Just to be clear, I'm not pretending like everyone can just go home once the time limit is up. Bad things will happen if you just run out the timer. But to concentrate my point, let me put it like this. In game one, you know that the man you're looking for is in those dread dungeons. You cannot leave until you've combed over every inch of that hell looking for him. That is the purpose that drives you. Once you find him, then you can decide on what you want to do. In game two, you may or may not have a reason to be here. Most likely, the reason isn't that urgent. Game one, you try to survive to complete the mission. Game two, your mission is trying to survive. And I think it's clear by the rest of this video which one I personally prefer. I hope Happy Paintings ends up returning to that focused narrative and game design he displayed in the original. Perhaps this time with the knowledge and tools he learned from undertaking this tremendous new project. Although, I had it pointed out to me that Fear and Hunger 2 could be a modern take of the game, both literally and figuratively. I'm quoting this directly. I actually buy this completely. If you view Fear and Hunger 2 as a potential starting point for newcomers, then it makes sense, doesn't it? The way I read it, you experience the more sensible game, and then if you want to experience the more extreme version, you can go back in time get the raw, more punishing experience without all those modern sensibilities to interfere. If I had to pick my favorite part of Fear and Hunger, the part that distills the entire feeling I'm looking for into a condensed solution that I can inject into my veins, I'd have to pick ending E. The way the game outright refuses your decision with such nonchalance is very funny to me, but I also can't help but worry for my character. When did he get here? 
Was he sent here to die? No, that's too simple. He would have already died by now if that was the case. No, something led him here. No, 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 something put him here. His life starts on the hills looking upon the dungeons of fear and hunger. His past, his history, the entirety of his personhood is constructed only in relation to the unique suffering he will experience here and only here. Every meaningful event in his life, every feeling he felt, every hand held, every lesson learned was all to be put to use here. As cruel as it sounds, he began here. This is the point of origin for his life. Everything else grows out from here. I would say he ends here, but I don't think it ends. How many times has he gone through this? How many times has he escaped the dungeons only to find himself looking back on them? How many times has he turned this corner, lost this arm, sat in this chair, thought these words? Should he refuse his fate, fate will laugh. The laughter is cold, and if you listen to it too closely, you may be unfortunate enough to hear it. I'd like to say a quick thank you to my patrons. Okay, here's my actual ideal headcanon for the game. The little girl grows up happy in one of those medieval cottagecore towns. She becomes a teacher and a strong farmer. She tries to take up an instrument, but she's not very good at it. She dies of old age, surrounded by the people she loves, having lived a life mostly unafraid and having eaten good food. For the second game, I honestly see more chemistry between Karin and Marco than I do between her and Don. Honestly though, Marco has chemistry with everybody. I think that they all survive the Termina Festival and go on to start the world's first hype house. And they all become Marco's wives. Except Caligura. He gets fear and hungered. 